Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us at our event, Current and Emerging Issues in Technology, Intellectual Property Law, Property, Entertainment, and Media Law. Uh, I'm Christopher Yu, the John H. Chestnut Professor of Law, Communication, and Computer Information Science, and the founding director of the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition. And uh, I'm thrilled to be welcoming you to uh, once again to another year of terrific programming. Uh, this, as you, those of you who've been with us before know, this is a part of a monthly series that we do to talk about different cutting edge issues and research that different members of the faculty are following and are doing, uh, are pursuing in their work. And that it will vary in terms of different topics throughout the year, but as is our tradition, we kick it off with a overview of various emerging issues that coming out of the end of the summer is a natural time to look forward look back at recent events that have happened, major developments, and to look forward to future, uh, future what the next year might hold. And so we're really delighted to have you all here and to share our thoughts with you today. A few logistical things. Uh, before I begin introducing our speakers, I wanted to make sure that everyone on the, who's participating in the event knows that it is being recorded. Uh, for those of you who are getting CLE credit, there will be three passwords that pop up as polls. Keep an eye out for them and write them down as you will need to put them on your evaluation form in order to receive proper credit. Uh, one small change in the program due to uh, unexpected, unforeseen circumstances, Anita Allen, who was originally scheduled to be joining us, will be unable to do so. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we have three fantastic speakers to, to carry on. We will miss Anita and we will try to make it up to you in some other future month by developing a programming around uh, the issues she was going to talk about with us today. So without further ado, we have three terrific speakers. Um, uh, we will go uh, start off with Herb Hovenkamp before proceeding to Gideon Parchamovsky and then talk to, uh, then handing it off to one of our newest colleagues, Jennifer Rothman. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you here. Herb is the John, James G. Dinan University professor who is, holds the joint appointments in both the Law School and the Wharton School as one of Penn Integrates Knowledge Professors, or this is what we call PIC Professors, which is one of the rare and most distinguished positions at our university. Often called the Dean of American Antitrust, he is a leading expert on antitrust law and the author of the leading treatise, also a major author of the leading treatise in antitrust and IP, and a fabulous historian of the intellectual history of economic thought. Uh, as for those of you, many people know him as an antitrust scholar, but uh, if you look at his vita, you'll discover his original PhD was in history. Uh, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, winner of the Justice Department's John Sherman Award, and recent honoree of a volume called a Liber Amicorum, uh, honoring his life's work. Uh, I'm happy to hand things over to Herb to give us his thoughts about the current issues, and if this isn't enough for you, uh, CTIC and the Penn Law Antitrust Association is sponsoring an all-day event on October 29th at which he will be giving the keynote address. Herb, take it away. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you very much uh, for putting up with me for a few minutes. Uh, the antitrust uh, issues raised in the previous oh, year or a little less are fairly broad. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Supreme Court's decision in the NCAA case because it's kind of fading into the past right now. I'd be glad to take a question about it if someone has one later on. Uh, so I'm kind of going to divide this up, talk a little bit about current litigation, uh, the uh, pending and uh, finished agency appointments, a little bit about the agency's agenda focusing particularly on the elements in uh, President Biden's executive order about uh, facilitating more competitive markets by a variety of, uh, of means. Uh, but anyway, first of all, uh, is the dismissal in the Federal Trade Commission's Facebook complaint. Uh, the uh, Federal Trade Commission sued Facebook in the waning months of the Trump administration with a complaint that seemed to a lot of observers to be somewhat hastily drafted. Uh, and sure enough, uh, the district judge dismissed it uh, mainly for failing to allege uh, a relevant market or market power properly. Uh, the claims were of various kinds. Uh, there were two uh, merger challenges, one Facebook's uh, acquisition of Instagram, 
and the other Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp. And then there are also a number of contract uh, restrictions that uh, the FTC, uh, FTC challenged. All of those are what we call market power offenses, which means you have to show substantial market power in order to basically proceed to look at conduct. And uh, the court held that uh, the market in that original complaint was fairly poorly de uh, defined. One of this is gonna be a big problem in the social network uh, litigation because these, these firms uh, provide so many different services. Uh, and for most of them, they do not have uh, a dominant position in the uh, in the uh, in the market, so uh, Facebook attempted to uh, the FTC attempted to aggregate a market of social personal social networking uh, services, and the court didn't buy that. Now, since then, Facebook has filed an amended complaint, uh, and the amended complaint is frankly better. It still alleges the same market. Uh, but it has more supporting uh, uh, al allegations. And uh, we haven't seen a motion to dismiss yet in that amended complaint. And of course, as a result, we haven't seen a uh, judge's order uh, either. But assuming they get past the motion to dismiss, in that case, we'll go on into, uh, into litigation. Now, at about the same time, the Justice Department filed an antitrust complaint against Google Google chose not to write a motion to dismiss. They're almost automatic in antitrust, but they're not required by the federal rules of civil procedure. Uh, so it is uh, going straight to uh, discovery and then a probable motion for summary judgment. And looking at this uh, calendar, it's very likely that's going to take two and a half or three years before we ever see much uh, conclusive activity. There might be some, you know, motions in limine to exclude experts, things like that along the way. But that case is going to wind on for uh, for quite a, a while. In private antitrust litigation, the most high-profile case has been Epic Games uh, versus Apple. That was basically a dispute about the way that Apple operates uh, its app store and particularly the royalties it charges for uh, any software or program game uh, it sells in the App Store that is has a positive price. Things, a lot of things in the App Store are free, but if it if it has a positive price, then uh, Apple takes a commission, traditionally thirty percent. Although Apple's been under some pressure recently, and it's starting to reduce that. And uh, what Epic wanted uh, was basically to break open the iPhone platform so that uh, there could be competing sales of, uh, of uh, software on the iPhone platform, a lot like we have today with respect to uh, Windows and, and Mac uh, operating, operating systems. Uh, uh, Epic lost all of the antitrust claims in that case, case went to trial, a bench trial. Epic was only seeking an injunction, not damages. So it went to a bench trial. Uh, the court ruled against uh, Epic once again, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly on grounds of market power and market definition. Although it also found uh, some, it also gave credence to Apple's defense uh, that exclusivity of sales on the uh, iPhone platform was necessary in order for Apple to protect uh, both the iPhone and subsequent transactions from, uh, from interference, like viruses and uh, other kinds of third-party in interference. Apple's used that defense in the past uh, with respect to iTunes, and it succeeded, and now it has succeeded again. However, the court did hold for Epic on a state law unfair competition claim under, under California state law. And uh, under, that, uh, under that unfair competition law, 
the judge issued an order uh, requiring Apple uh, to permit uh, purchasers to make subsequent sales, uh, to make subsequent purchasers of, you know, Apple, of uh, Epic add-ons uh, off of the platform and as a result not be charged a uh, commission. Now, the inter a couple of interesting things about that, uh, about that state law order is that it is under state law. Uh, it purports to be a nationwide injunction uh, and that raises a question that frequently comes up in antitrust, which is to what extent uh, can you use state law to create a nationwide uh, injunction? That is, is, does this exceed the legislative jurisdiction of the state of California, particularly since federal law today has a pretty strong presumption of uh, against extraterritoriality? And the California Supreme Court's already approved that uh, presumption with respect to the very same uh, statute that's at issue in uh, in this case. But currently, you could have bought your iPhone in Pennsylvania from a, a vendor located in Pennsylvania. You could have made all your purchases in Pennsylvania, and uh, and the order would still apply to those transactions, even though the order is entirely under state law. Perhaps for that reason, uh, Epic has appealed to the Ninth Circuit uh, the loss of the federal antitrust uh, claims. Uh, Apple has not yet appealed the loss of the state law claim, and I think it probably will, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Now, as you may know, the wheels of the Ninth Circuit turn rather slowly, so it may be a while before we hear much more uh, about that. Okay, then moving on uh, is uh, agency appointments. Uh, Lena Khan was appointed and confirmed and is now chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Jonathan Cantor uh, has been a uh, uh, appointed by President Biden to be head of the antitrust division. He has not yet been confirmed. Uh, Ms. Khan is very young, doesn't have a whole lot of experience, uh, but she had some support, including from the right side of, uh, of the Senate, uh, largely because of her interest in applying non-economic criteria to antitrust enforcement. Uh, Cantor is today kind of leftish leaning, pro enforcement. Uh, he's spent the recent part of his career litigating against Google. Uh, however, earlier in his career, he was uh, pretty much on defendant's side. In fact, I know him from 20, almost 25 years ago when I was working for the United States on the Microsoft case, and Cantor was aligned with. Uh, a couple of clients that were uh, affiliated with uh, with with Microsoft. Uh, I assume I haven't heard anything to the contrary. I assume that he will be uh, confirmed. Okay, then uh, what's been happening in the agencies? Well, the biggest and most recent one was that uh, last week on a three to two vote, the Federal Trade Commission withdrew. Uh, vertical merger guidelines that had been uh, issued uh, in, 19, in 2020, late in the Trump administration. Uh, the uh, Justice Department declined to withdraw them, saying that they were going to leave them in place. Uh, and this has provoked a fair amount of pushback against the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, number one, because it may it doesn't sound like it's consistent with the spirit of President Biden's executive order, which was, quote, to review the horizontal and merger guidelines and consider whether to revise those guidelines. Well, the, the horizontal merger guidelines have been revised six times. And in the past, uh, the agencies have never withdrawn them. They have basically kept them in place and relied on them up until the time that the new guidelines were approved. And then the new guidelines succeeded to the older ones. The withdrawal basically means that uh, there's going to be a period of time here, and it could be a fairly lengthy period in which uh, the Federal Trade Commission does not have any vertical 
merger guidelines to rely on them. And that also has already cost them one big, big loss. Uh, that is the lack of merger guidelines. It was the Justice Department in a case uh, against Time Warner for a vertical merger that in, uh, with, uh, with AT&T. And the court cited the absence of any operative guidelines in dismissing that uh, that case. And there's a couple of vertical merger cases pending right now in the Federal Trade Commission where uh, the litigants up until now have been relying on the guidelines. And so, uh, you know, it's possible that the Federal Trade Commission has simply pulled the rug out from under its feet in the short term. Uh, and no obvious reason why it had to withdraw the guidelines in order to uh, go ahead and revise and revise them as the executive order suggests. Uh, the other thing, if you know anything at all about President Biden, and that is he does not like dissent among his own agencies. Uh, Trump wasn't very concerned about that. And indeed the FTC and the Justice Department were at loggerheads a couple of times during the Trump administration. But this means that already right out of the box, uh, the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department are taking uh, in, inconsistent positions. Uh, and then finally, and then I'll move on, uh, in, in its withdrawal statement, the Federal Trade Commission cited two economic doctrines reflected in the guidelines uh, as a rationale for withdrawing them. And with respect to both of them, the withdrawal statement made some pretty serious economic errors. That is to say, these were not far out uh, artsy uh, economic uh, principles or doctrines that the uh, guidelines were relying on. They were fairly mainstream uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the FTC was economically mistaken uh, when it cited uh, them uh, in, its, uh, in its withdrawal statement. The fact is that the vertical merger guidelines really do ramp up vertical uh, antitrust enforcement against vertical mergers. Apparently, they just don't do it enough uh, for the Federal Trade Commission and perhaps not in ways that uh, the Federal Trade Commission prefers. Now, I'm going to move on. I'm running out of time here. So for the future, uh, what's going to be happening? Well, number one, patents. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the Trump administration's new Madison doctrine, it was articulated by uh, Macon Delarim, the chair of the, uh, uh, the head of the antitrust division at the time, which was basically a doctrine that antitrust policy should stay out of licensing disputes regarding intellectual property. Uh, that statement itself was highly questionable. The Clayton Act expressly prohibits certain kinds of licensing agreements. Uh, they have been pretty central to antitrust enforcement for a long time. This was widely seen as uh, just a kind of uh, pro-patent ploy kind of represents a war that's gone on as long as I've been around between Republicans and Democrats with Republicans favoring uh, very strong patents and Democrats not so much. The result is that Republicans tend to favor old technology patents, Rust Belt patents, we sometimes call them, while uh, Democrats favor Silicon Valley patents. Uh, but uh, you know that, that's a big dispute, covers a lot of territory. Uh, the, uh, the, the speeches and statements supporting uh, this doctrine from the Trump administration have all been demoted now. And I just don't see what's going to, I don't know yet what's going to happen at this time. There is no formal statement. And of course, because we don't have a head of the antitrust division yet, we may have to wait until, uh, until that appointment has been, uh, has been made. Uh, there's a whole bunch of pending legislation going on, a lot of it involving the platforms. For the most part, and particularly the more aggressive part, seem to be stuck in Congress. And so, you know, basically at this stage, there's nothing to report about it. And then finally, uh, 
in July, uh, President Biden ex uh, issued an executive order uh, on competitiveness in American markets, which is in which includes but is not limited to uh, antitrust topics. Uh, it uh, opens with the observation that the amount of monopoly power in the American uh, economy has grown considerably, basically setting the 1980s as the starting point. Uh, and once again, there's a lot of ideological uh, difference about that proposition. Uh, although, you know, a lot of very notable mainstream prominent economists today believe that it's true. In spite of that, uh, I would not characterize the current executive order as a progressive document. If what you mean by progressive is radically uh, ramped up antitrust enforcement, and more particularly antitrust enforcement that reaches out beyond economics to a lot of other criteria. In fact, uh, the, the guidelines uh, make one statement about the proper scope of the antitrust laws. It's a quotation actually from Justice Black in uh, a 1950s antitrust case basically saying, quote, that the antitrust laws rest on the premise that the unrestrained interaction of competitive forces will yield the best allocation of our economic resources, the lowest price, the highest quality, and the greatest material progress, while at the same time providing an environment conducive to the preservation of our democratic, political, and social institutions. I would say that's a fairly centrist description of what antitrust currently does. Yes, the principal concern is economic, but First Amendment values frequently come in, particularly if we're talking about speech restraints. Concerns about federalism come in all the time, particularly when we're talking about potential conflicts between federal antitrust law and state antitrust law. But I don't see anything in the executive order that uh, calls for removing uh, antitrust central concerns uh, with economics. The uh, executive order also calls for review of the horizontal and merger guidelines. Like I said earlier, I think the FTC's unilateral withdrawal is inconsistent, at least with the spirit of that statement in the guidelines, although we can quibble about whether it actually violates them. But clearly, one of the things that the uh, executive order contemplates is that the two agencies will review both the horizontal and the vertical merger guidelines and then consider whether they should be uh, revised. Another thing it, complicates, it contemplates is the increased use of Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which prohibits unfair methods of competition uh, without specifying exactly what those things are. And back in the 1960s in particular, the Supreme Court developed this idea that the term unfair methods of competition reaches more broadly to, than the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act to practices that may not literally violate those statutes. I think there's a good chance we will see at least an attempt to make a, a comeback there. The executive order also calls for doing something about employee non-competition agreements, employee mobility, and the impact of reduced employee mobility on wages has been a big issue. Uh, the uh, Justice Department has picked up on it. Uh, there's been more private litigation. And frankly, after years and years of both neglect and anti-union hostility, uh, the position of American labor in the workplace is much, much weaker, much, much weaker than it was uh, back in the 1980s. So I think we're going to see some ramping up there. The, the uh, executive order also asks uh, the agencies to revisit the right to repair. Now, this comes up in a lot of different contexts, uh, but the most common one is durable, costly equipment that has uh, built-in diagnostics 
and requires proprietary uh, software uh, to engage the diagnostics. And the result is that uh, companies that make this equipment can, can make it very difficult for independent repair organizations to uh, fix them. This issue has been litigated under the antitrust laws, and there was one pretty important decision uh, in the early 90s, uh, Kodak versus Image Tech came up in the uh, photocopier market. Uh, but there are other issues, a great many of which have to do with the scope of protection of the Copyright Act and the Digital Millennium, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So uh, I'm hoping we'll, we're going to see some clarification and very likely some expansion there. Uh, the executive order also uh, requests expanded enforcement of the Packers and Stockyards Act. That's an act that was passed during, uh, actually prior to the New Deal, was widely used in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It contains, it contains basically five substantive provisions, two of which are antitrust-like and require an injury to competition. And the other three are more like tort statutes. They cover things like underweighing. That has been a big, big issue, particularly with respect to Tyson's, where farmers complain that they grow chickens for Tyson's and Tyson's then picks them up and weighs them. And the weights that Tyson reports are always less than uh, the farmer's own estimates of the weights of their chickens. So some of that's going to come up, uh, I presume, under the Packers and Stockyards Act. Importantly, Packers and Stockyards Act can be enforced by private plaintiffs, but when it's enforced by the government, it's generally by the Department of Agriculture, not by the antitrust uh, division. Uh, the, the executive order calls for expansion of antitrust involvement uh, with respect to patents and particularly standard essential patents. These are patents that are committed uh, to shared network technologies like cell phones, autonomous driving, uh, a great deal of the, of the internet, uh, and so on. And that's why I also think that the uh, Trump administration's new Madison doctrine uh, does not have much, uh, not much life uh, left. Uh, it also asks for more aggressive enforcement against pay for delay settlements, which were condemned by uh, the Supreme Court in a Breyer opinion, FTC versus activists about 15 years ago. Since then, private plaintiffs have not had a whole lot of luck with respect to delayed payment settlements. These are settlements that basically defer uh, the entry of generic drugs in exchange for large payments of money. Uh, the uh, original pioneer drug manufacturer and the settling generic make out like bandits, uh, but the impact is that they, uh, they hold off on new entry, and of course, Generic drugs are supposed to facilitate new entry. Uh, and the result is that consumers pick up paying an enormous, an enormous bill. So I do expect some activity uh, in the area of pay for delay settlements as well. I am out of time. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna turn this back to Christopher. Thank you. Well, thank you, Herb, uh, for getting us off to such a great start. What's fascinating to me is uh, you and I both know that this big merger between AT&T and Time Warner you mentioned that led to such a big fight was uh, pushed through and bought, went through for $85 million. And that ironically that AT&T has now undone that merger after all the Sturm and Drang for a cool $43 billion. So at a half a loss. So it's fascinating how this has turned out. Um, yes, it is. That happens, by the way, to a lot of mergers. They oh, end yes. up not being nearly as profitable as the parties uh, contemplating them thought at the time the merger occurred. Well, the other thing I have to say is um, if you're interested in Herb's views on the new Madison argument, uh, about three weeks ago, he published an article in Pro Market in which he uh, starts to elaborate his views. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to follow up there and uh, to, to read that further. 
Uh, so to God, thank you, Herb. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker, who is Gideon Parchamowski. Uh, Gideon Parchamowski is the Robert G. Fuller Jr. Professor of Law. Uh, he is a special, it's hard, I was about to say he specializes in intellectual property and property because that's the work I know you the best, but that does you such a huge injustice. You've done work in cyber law, corporate and securities law, insurance law, and evidence law, and made significant contributions to all of them. And I found my, really validated because um, if you look at the, there's a, a very high profile ranking of citations by subject matter that uh, makes its way through law professor circles. And what I'll tell you right now is that the ranking system doesn't know what to do with Gideon. Uh, they actually have him referenced in the property group and the intellectual property group. And I'll tell you right now, he, they keep him outside because they don't know what to do with him. But if you put him in those, he'd be in the very t top three or four scholars and in corporate and securities among like the top nine scholars. It's quite astounding to me the breadth of his expertise, but he's also just such a wonderful colleague and a friend. Uh, he is actually going to talk to us today, I guess there's many, many more things about him, but uh, to get to the better part, he's going to share with us his thoughts about the Supreme Court's decision last April in Google versus Oracle, which I don't know if Gideon will agree with this, but I assume he will, but um, I would say is the most significant copyright decision the Supreme Court has handed down in decades. And so, uh, Gideon, we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you so much, Christopher. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to participate in. Uh, I always learn a lot from uh, uh, our events and from listening to my colleagues. So I should also thank uh, Jen and uh, Herb. Uh, their expertise is invaluable and it's just great to interact with them. Uh, and thank you so much again, Christopher, for the generous, generous introduction. And I agree with you. Um, Google versus Oracle is probably the most important uh, fair use case. Uh, some may even argue that it is the most important copyright decision uh, given by the Supreme Court. So with, with your permission, um, I prepared some slides that uh, I would like to share with you, and I, I hope that they will uh, make everything clear. So I think you can now uh, see my slides, right? Is that true? Let's see. Uh, are the slides showing? They are, Gideon. Excellent, okay. So this case, um, took several years, and I would say that the tech sector was following it with bated breath, and here's what happened uh, in this case. So this case concerned Google's copying, borrowing, using, call it what you want, uh, 37 packages comprising roughly 11,500 lines of code in Java's application programming interface API um, for use in its very famous Android platform, um, according to some estimates, uh, 2.5 2 billion people worldwide are using uh, this platform. Uh, it's you know, it's an open platform, and that's important. It was very important um, in the context of the case, but as I will try to argue, also very important um, uh, in the real world. Now, it is quite interesting how this case arose, because in the beginning, it, everything looked quite good. Um, when uh, the code was originally developed, the original developers were quite happy to let Google use it, but uh, then subsequently Oracle took over and the parties tried to negotiate a deal. There was an impasse and not surprisingly, I think it's not surprising because Google does it all the time, Google decided to go forward with its plan um, despite Oracle's opposition and a case ensued. Now, the impact of this case was enormous, and the potential consequences, I think, were as enormous. 
And normally when I'm on the same panel with her, I've been, he presents antitrust cases. Uh, I'm just, you know, I cower in a corner because the amounts involved in antitrust litigation um, are very, very high. And in copyright cases, regularly, they're not so high. But uh, in this case, the number $9 billion was thrown around. So a lot was at stake here. Now, as importantly, if not more importantly, uh, the future of technology was on the line. We don't have a lot of case law about the copyright ability of software. So Christopher was correct. Uh, it was a one in a million case uh, for us who follow the tech sector and are interested in copyright and in software. So now let's focus on the case. There were really two rounds here. So Google gets sued by Oracle, and its first line of defense is that the code was insufficiently original to warrant copyright protection. And I think that was a stronger argument, even if the commands were sufficiently original. This code, and we're talking about API, and even more specifically, declaring code cannot receive copyright protection. Why? Because it is a method, um, it is functional, and it is excluded under the statute, under the Copyright Act. The trial court amazingly ruled for Google and decided that the code was ineligible for copyright protection. Oracle appeals, and as you can see, the Federal Circuit reversed. He determined that the API in this case is copyrighted, and it remanded the case to the trial court so it can examine Google's fair use defense. Google petitioned for a cert, but was denied in round one. Okay, so we hit restart and we begin round two. So in, run, in round two, the focal point is fair use. The trial court once again finds for Google. The decision is appealed and the federal circuit again reverses it rules that Google's use is not fair, far from it, and sends the case back to the trial court so it can proceed to the remedies phase. Um, Google once again tries, it, tries its luck. It uh, petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court for a writ of certiorari, uh, and the Supreme Court grants cert this time. So the case goes to the Supreme Court. Okay. Here's what happened in the Supreme Court. You all know how the Supreme Court decided the case. Um, no need to create suspense. In a six to two decision, the Supreme Court ruled that Google's use was fair. Writing for the majority, Justice Breyer ruled that Google's use was highly transformative and that the 11,500 lines of code emphasized it constituted about 0.4% of Google's code in its entirety. The analysis, I think, is very interesting, unusual in some ways, um, standard in others, but I would say that this is not your ordinary fair use decision. So allow me to get into the details, and I think we're doing okay on time. I'm sure we're doing okay on time, so everything is going to be okay. So Justice Breyer starts by explaining the challenge of applying copyright protection to software, and for me, this was like a journey in time, because I remember when protection was extended to software and all the issues that came, all the issues that came up, all the problems that arose, the challenges, and here they are, here they are again. So 
software, as we all know, contains expression, but ultimately it is supposed to perform a functional task for us. So there is this duality that we cannot get rid of. Uh, it is a process or a method of operation, yet it is expressed in code. So there is expression there to which copyright protection can attach, but if we give it standard copyright protection, it may have a chilling effect on creativity. It may become a problem for innovation. And Justice Breyer, he continues along this path and now he focuses on declaring code. Um, so what is the declaring code? It is part of the API and it can describe it can be described in several ways. But before that, what is the API itself? So the API is code that allows for interoperability between different types of software. And we're talking about high level commands when it comes to the declaring code or highly abstract concepts that then needs to be developed. And the development is done via what is called implementing code. But Google, let's be precise here, only copied the declaring, the declaring code. It wrote its own implementation code or implementing code. And just as prior, therefore, focuses on the declaring code and writes that it is inextricably bound together with a general system, the division of computing tasks that no one claims is a proper subject of copyright. So already he's pointing us in the direction in which he wants to lead us that, look, copyright protection may exist, but it has to be thin in its scope. Uh, we're not talking about what we would call traditional copyrightable subject matter. And he also adumbrates his future course by pointing out that fair use can serve a very important function here by determining the proper scope of protection. And now he proceeds to the traditional fair use factors, uh, but he changes the order. So factor one in the decision is actually not the statutory, is not the first statutory factor. And it is usually a factor that doesn't get much play, um, the nature of the copyrighted work, but for the majority, it does a lot of work. So he starts with this factor and points out that the magnitude and scope of copyright protection varies among classes of work. Software or code is a special subject matter that does not perfectly fit the framework of copyright law. It is there, right? Congress decided to extend copyright protection to software, but somehow it's not a perfect fit. And declaring code especially is functional and falls outside the core of copyright. As for the implementing code, Google did not copy the implementing code, but wrote it itself. So the first factor in Justice Breyer's analysis weighs in favor of fair use. As for the second factor, the purpose and character of use, um, Justice Breyer writes that Google's use of Java Sans API was for the purpose of creating new copyrighted content Hence, the use is highly transformative and it is consistent with the purpose of copyright law. He admits that Google use was commercial, but proceeds to point out that this fact does not negate fair use. So the point here, just to make sure that you are all with me, that uh, the Android platform enabled 
the creation of a rich of a rich world of expressive content and therefore what happened here is consistent with the goals of our copyright system which is to induce creativity so the second factor two weighs in favor of fair use as for the third factor amount and substantiality taken so here is what justice Pryor has to say about the third factor he agrees that Google appropriated 11,500 lines of code. And let's be honest, that's a lot. Virtually all the declaring code needed to perform the relevant tasks. The declaring code constituted though a small portion, only 0.4% of the Sun Java API and the code Google copied is functional in nature. So this is a proportionality test and the majority believes that Google did not exceed the permitted amount. Um, so proportionality is met in this case and this factor too weighs in favor of fair use. As for effect on market, Clearly, Oracle lost a lot of money, and we'll get to that. But loss of revenue, Justice Barr says, is not the whole story. Transformative uses such as parodies may lead to loss of revenues, uh, but they're nonetheless fair. Google's use enables interoperability, generating a significant public benefit points out again that it is highly transformative and that the public benefit ought to be taken into account. Google's use enabled a distinct market that is different from Java's uses and he specifically refers to cell phones and this two ways in favor of fair use. There was also a dissenting opinion in this case um, penned by Justice Thomas, with whom Justice Alito agreed, and I think it is a very strong uh, dissent. And unsurprisingly, Justice Thomas is an originalist, and that's the direction he, he goes in, but I believe we should take this opinion seriously. I think that there are certain points he makes that have a lot of merit. So he begins by pointing out, and that's his framing. It's quite interesting how the two justices frame their opinions differently. So he actually begins with the fourth factor, pointing out to the fact that Google's unauthorized copying erased 97.5% of the value of Oracle's partnership with Amazon. So it's a big loss, uh, estimated in the billions. And he points out that Google could have licensed the software. It's true, as I mentioned at the outset, there were negotiations, they reached an impasse, but you know, impasses can be overcome if more money is put on the table. Justice Thomas likewise believes that there was no risk of public harm and that the majority's analysis is exaggerated and speculative. And he then points out that the majority's fair use analysis is predicated on a distinction between declaring and implementing code, a distinction that the statute rejects. So this distinction cannot be found in the Copyright Act. And Justice Thomas is an originalist. He looks to the statute for instruction and he cannot find this distinction. And it's true, it's not in the statute. Okay, two more points. As for the nature of use, uh, the court, Justice Thomas tells us, never sanctioned unauthorized copying that yielded billions of dollars to the copyist. Google, Google's use is also not transformative in Justice Thomas's view. It used the code for essentially the same purpose as Oracle. It's for the amount and substantiality taken, the proper denominator should be the Java 
declaring code that was copied, not the whole code. And you know, the denominator here, as in many other legal contexts, matters a great deal. And finally, Justice Thomas points out that not only did Google copy 11,500 lines of code, but also the declaring code it copied constitutes the heart of the work. So he believes that this is the heart of the work. Justice Breyer believes that this is the functional part that deserves very low protection. So three thoughts with which I will conclude. Um, this decision miss, lifts many of us unsatisfied and some of us deeply unsatisfied because it did not resolve the issue of the copyrightability of code. I have to say the dissent did. Uh, Justice Thomas is very clear about it and he goes after the majority time and again for not resolving this issue. Now, of course, implicitly, the majority accepts the assumption, I would say the fact that code is protected. Otherwise, you know, why get to fair use? But it does not say so explicitly. I don't think that the majority wanted to engage in this analysis of what is protected, what is not, and it limited itself to the task that it had to perform in order to issue a decision in this case. What else is new? Public benefit as an important determinant, determinant of fair use. And here it is easy to agree, I think, but there is still something quite problematic going on because Google in a way benefited from the fact that, you know, what it did became so widespread by the time the case was litigated many, many individuals were using the Android platform. A lot was at stake here. But remember, all this happened because Google acted without permission, without authorization. So it took a gamble as it often does in, you know, as in a good action movie, maybe it's a legal action movie or a thriller. It gets saved at the end and it was a cliffhanger because uh, a lot could go wrong for Google here and somehow once again it emerged uh, victorious. And finally, we have to think about the protection of downstream programmers. Uh, I'm referring to code writers who wrote applications for the Android platform. And look, uh, a fair use ruling as it stands now only helps the, the specific defendant. So we know that Google's use was fair, but it doesn't help the multiple, pro, the multiple programmers who are not covered by this decision. And in an article that Professor Abraham Bell and I published, we suggested a second version of fair use. Uh, the article is called Propertizing Fair Use, and the fair use model that we developed in this article is specifically designed for a case like this. And the idea there is to say that, well, not only will Google be sheltered by the court's fair use ruling, but rather everyone who acted with permission or blessing from Google and developed application programs for Android. Otherwise, we get a very strange legal status quo because Google is protected, but all the other programmers, code writers, users receive no protection. And we give the court discretion to choose whether it wants to find fair use of the traditional type as it did in this case. And I would like to emphasize right now, there is no second type. Right now, the vision that we develop does not exist as part of our legal system. It's, uh, it's a normative proposal. But we believe that this proposal should be on the table and we should allow courts to use it in suitable cases. Thank you so much for being with me and for listening. And that's it. Thank you, Christopher, again. 
Well, thank you very much, Gideon. And uh, it's, been, it's a fantastic presentation of a very complex case. Uh, as those of you who are following the Q&A uh, are aware, we have been unable to uh, use the electronic version of the passwords. So I am going to give verbally the first two passwords for the CLE. The first one is Sunshine. The second one is University. So that's Sunshine and University to make sure to, that people who would like to get CLE credit are able to do so. Well, uh, then we, at this point, we will proceed to our third speaker. Our third speaker is Jennifer Rothman, who is the Nicholas F. Galicchio Professor of Law here at Penn. We're especially pleased to have her here in her first CTIC appearance as a, a full Peldoff faculty member. You remember she participated in a number of events last semester as a visiting professor, but now we are delighted to welcome her here full time into the Penn family. We couldn't be more delighted. Uh, she is a nationalized, nationally recognized expert in the field of intellectual property law generally in many different dimensions, but in particular, she recently published uh, a book, The Right of Publicity, Privacy Reimagined for a Public World, which is without question the definitive work in the right of publicity. She maintains an online resource called Rothman's Rap to the right, right, Roadmap to the Right of Publicity that is recognized as the definitive, between the two, as the definitive source of all of those issues. This is in addition to her work in trademark and in copyright and other things, and she brings to us a, a very distinctive uh, background. Uh, prior to becoming a legal academic, she received an MFA in film production from the USC Celebrated School of Cinematic Arts and proceeded to have a career directing award-winning documentaries and working in the film industry and including feature production at Paramount Pictures. So she brings an expertise and a perspective very rare among faculty. And this is in addition to her excellence as a scholar. Uh, the last time she presented a paper at Penn uh, two, two times ago was an article called The First Amendment and the Rights of Publicity, which was subsequently published in the Yale Law Journal. Her most recent publication last spring, Navigating the Identity Thicket, Trademarks, Lost Theory of Personality, the Right of Publicity and Preemption, is now forthcoming in the Harvard Law Review. Uh, she's going to share with us her thoughts on a major Third Circuit de decision called Hep versus Facebook, decision de rendered less than a week ago about a dating services use of a local celebrity's photo in an advertisement without her authorization. Uh, love to have you, delighted to have you here in your new capacity as our, our full-time colleague. Jennifer. Thank you so much, Christopher, for that wonderful welcome. And uh, thank you also, uh, all of my colleagues, for your comments today. I learned a ton uh, from each of your presentations and all about subjects that, that I'm familiar with and, and, and really added a lot to, to my thinking. Um, so uh, I don't know if it's just because I've moved uh, to Philadelphia, but Pennsylvania has become sort of a hot spot of, um, of right of publicity litigation over the last couple of years and some of the most interesting cases involving the right of publicity um, have originated here and its conflict with the First Amendment, and this one, a conflict with the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. Um, I imagine that many in this room are already familiar with the right of publicity, but if you're less familiar with it, it is a state right that protects against unauthorized uses of your identity, usually your name uh, or likeness, but could be more broad. And it varies quite widely from to state to state. And, and frankly, out of frustration with the radically varying rules from state to state, I started my website so that you could click out on state laws and I personally and others would have the benefit of being able to keep track of what was going on. And we'll circle back in a few minutes to this variability of state law because it matters a lot for the Third Circuit's decision and what it means for other states or even here in Pennsylvania, which has both a statutory and a common law right of publicity. So as Christopher said, this case involves a local celebrity, in this case, a well-known news anchor, Karen Hepp. Now I will concede, although the papers claim in the reporting and Philly Magazine and the Philadelphia Inquirer suggest that she is famous. I, in fact, only know of her from this litigation, which I had been tracking and have not seen her, uh, but I gather she's the news anchor on the local Fox uh, affiliate. So what happened before she came to Philadelphia, and I think she may be, in fact be a Philadelphia native, but she was working in New York and she was captured in a convenience store in New York on their security cameras. 
And you might be thinking, well, don't the security cameras capture people all the time? Sure, yes. But someone must have recognized her as someone whose picture was worth something uh, out in the world or of interest to, to them. And so they got a still of the security camera footage. And then this was distributed out on the internet. And in particular, uh, the plaintiff in this case have objected to the use of this image in different contexts, in particular advertisements for erectile dysfunction drugs and for dating sites, as well as appearing on dating sites as if she was sort of a, a, a person who could be, uh, who was available for dating, which she found deeply offensive, uh, demeaning, sexually degrading. And so her complaint, which has two claims in it, uh, including Pennsylvania's statutory right of publicity and the common law right of publicity under the appropriation tort here, sounded both in economic damages and harm to her, her commercial value, but also very much in terms of dignitary concerns, damage to her personal reputation, her individual status in the community, as well as her ability to control as a matter of autonomy, her own identity. Now, when she sued, so these postings, just to, to add a little bit more to the picture, were posted on Facebook's website, these advertisements on um, Imager, on Reddit, and was used on Giphy. And so she sued these intermediaries rather than whoever got her picture out onto the internet. So the main problem for her litigation and for her lawsuit was one that the district court Jennifer, we've lost your audio. Oh, sorry, there. sorry. I'm. I think I'm back. I don't know why that happened. Um, I'm not sure where you lost me. Uh, a couple sentences back. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. Oh, sorry. No worries. Um, so maybe I'll just back up a second. I was saying that these the main defense for these social media companies was Section 230, and so if you're not familiar with that, Section 230 immunizes interactive computer service providers uh, from being treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Now this exemption from liability or the protections or shelter of section 230 has its own exemption, which is for laws pertaining to intellectual property. And when it comes to a lawsuit like HEPs, this raises two major questions. One is, what do we mean by intellectual property for purposes of Section 230? And the crucial question is whether this intellectual property term as used in the federal statute only applies to federal intellectual property laws or also includes state intellectual property laws. The second question then is whether the right of publicity is such an intellectual property law if state laws are included. Now, the Ninth Circuit, prior to the Third Circuit's decision last week, was the only appellate court to make a clear holding on this question, and the Ninth Circuit held uh, that the CDA 230's intellectual property exception only applied to federal intellectual property, so state right of publicity laws uh, were not claims that could proceed if a defendant had a 230 defense. And so Third Circuit last week split ways with the Ninth Circuit, but prior to that, the district court here uh, in Pennsylvania had agreed with the Ninth Circuit and said, look, intellectual property only applies to federal laws. Why did the, the Third Circuit part ways and reverse the district court and part ways with the Ninth Circuit creating a circuit split, which may well lead to either rehearing on bank or a potential Supreme Court petition and uh, grant? given the split on a pretty important issue that's gonna affect many online companies. So the Third Circuit said pretty simply in a 2-1 decision, 
look, it says intellectual property. It doesn't say federal intellectual property. And so the plain language of the statute is clear on its face. It incorporates both federal and state intellectual property. When Congress wants to just say federal, it says so. And they point to some other places as have some other courts in the statute uh, that use the term federal as well as subsequent, uh, subsequent legislation. So in this, as they say, it's clear on its face and you cannot rely as Facebook did in its defense here just on policy arguments behind the passage of the CDA to help support the development of the internet to undo this plain language. In addition, the Third Circuit thought there were good policy reasons why we should allow claims like the right of publicity and state-based intellectual property laws to proceed under the same logic of having the exclusion for federal intellectual property laws. All right, so this set up back to our second question. So the Third Circuit says, Yes, the Section 230 exception to its shelter applies to both federal and state IP laws. Then we get to the second question, is the right of publicity an IP law? Well, one easy way to answer this question that the Third Circuit looked at is, well, what do legal dictionaries say? And many of them enumerate the right of publicity, list the right of publicity as a type of intellectual property law. And I think of it that way. And our IP group here uh, at Penn does, as well as many others, people who do right of publicity law often think of themselves as IP uh, specialists. And there's a lot of overlap between driven IP laws and the right of publicity. And the Third Circuit pointed to that over overlap as well. But the controversy of whether the right of publicity is or is not an intellectual property law stems in part from its origins and I think ongoing uh, both connection to and in many instances uh, identity with a right of privacy, which is more personal in nature and in some instances maybe less property-like. Although, as I've contended in my work, both the property and the personality aspects of the right of publicity and the right of privacy's appropriation branch really go hand in hand. So, but the Third Circuit sort of puts that dilemma aside by narrowing its holdings in some important ways and some ways that I want to highlight in my remaining few minutes of my comments. So the majority said, look, we're not deciding whether all rights of publicity claims are intellectual property or all states' rights of publicity are intellectual property. We're just deciding that the Pennsylvania right of publicity statute is a form of intellectual property, at least in the context like the one we have here, where we have a well-known individual who has evidence of the commercial value of her identity and in a context where we could claim a commercial injury. Notably, Pennsylvania has one of the most narrowly written statutes um, uh, in the country and one that limits plaintiffs to those on, under the statute, common law is a separate thing, under the statute to those who have a valuable interest in their identity and not just a valuable interest that might be recognized in the market because you can imagine a person who's not famous having their image taken without their permission and used in advertisements for dating sites and erectile dysfunction drugs as well. But the Pennsylvania statute limits it to plaintiffs who not only have a valuable interest in their identity, but that they have developed that value through the investment of time, effort, and money. So intentionally developed the value of their identities. And the court said, the Third Circuit said, in this instance, this is indeed, this is indeed an intellectual property right. Well, this left a host of things unanswered in this question, in this case, including whether the common law right of publicity in Pennsylvania uh, counts as intellectual property for purposes of the CDA 230. We don't know. We don't know whether if by some chance some person who was less famous was able to bring a claim under the statute or if they were able to bring it under the common law, if that would count as intellectual property. And thinking, thinking more broadly about the circuit split we now have with the Ninth Circuit, it's not clear what this means for other states' rights of publicity and whether they would be determined, even in the state, uh, even in the Third Circuit, whether they would be determined to be a form of intellectual property, meaning that plaintiff's lawsuits could go forward under that guise. 
Now, there was a dissent uh, from the panel decision, which was largely rooted in the policies behind the CDA 230 um, and suggesting that those policies clearly suggested that it was meant to be a very narrow exception for federal intellectual property. And many of the problems that I just raised with regard to the state to state variability undercut those policies. And so it would only make sense for the term intellectual property uh, to be used to mean federal law. Otherwise, it would undercut the development uh, of the internet. Now, so a few things that flow from this. One is this is a case to watch. It could be reheard on bank. It might go to the Supreme Court. But some other reasons to pay attention to this case is that it is yet more evidence of the waning enthusiasm, both for social media companies as well as for the CDA 230. We're in a very different world in 2021 than we were in the mid 1990s uh, with regard to wanting to support the development of the internet and internet uh, companies and e-commerce. We're in a very different space in what technology allows in terms of the monitoring of websites for questionable content. And so we are now shifting gears to courts and Congress being less solicitous of propping up internet companies um, and immunizing them from instances in which they might be, in which they might well be liable offline. Second thing to highlight here is that this opens the gates to lots of rights of publicity lawsuits um, in instances where individuals have felt that they haven't uh, had an opportunity to bring such claims because many of their misappropriation claims were deemed to be um, the intermediaries were free from liability under CDA 230. This happened recently in litigation out of the First Circuit in which a lawsuit against Backpage by women who were sort of um, offered up for sex work without their permission using their images on Backpage sued and it was sort of tossed largely uh, or in part on CDA 230 grounds. And the final uh, thing to, to follow here is this case isn't over. So even if the Third Circuit position on the CDA 230 immunity stands and the case proceeds against Facebook, the other companies were tossed out for personal jurisdiction reasons, this doesn't mean Facebook is liable. We now get back to the common law world that existed before CDA 230 which frankly gives opportunity for an evolution of the common law with regard to intermediary liability online that was subverted when Congress passed the CDA 230. So it gives an opportunity to think about whether Facebook is the publisher of this third party information, should it instead be treated like a distributor? And then we might look at whether they had reason to know about the infringing content or not, and therefore whether liability should flow from that. So there's a lot to watch uh, with regard to how this case goes forward. It has significant implications for social media companies. It also has significant implications for all of us and trying to manage how our images and names are appearing online. So definitely one to watch and I look forward to discussing it during our remaining time together. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer and to all the speakers we have. 14 minutes left. Uh, I'm happy to open the floor up to a broader discussion here. Any questions you may have, uh, you can uh, simply post them into the Q&A or uh, we can, if you, I don't know if, if there's a way for me to uh, allow, I've, I have the ability to allow you to talk directly. So if you can find a way to get my attention, I'm happy to enable that temporarily as well. So I, I admit to being fascinated, uh, just to start, um, uh, just a, a couple things. Uh, one thing that I thought might be helpful, uh, just as something uh, to that I have found to be helpful in terms of understanding the case that Gideon's talking about. And uh, um, uh, at the risk of uh, sneaking my way into the presentation, uh, as I'm just the moderator, I guess I'm not supposed to do that. But um, what I would say is, uh, this is my under, uh, understanding of the case that we hear talk about Google, we talk about declaring code, and we talk about uh, the other kinds of code. The declare, what they're really fighting about is this string up here, java.lang.math.max46. Uh, math46, max46 is which of those numbers is larger. They're subdivided also into classes of subroutines, and then they have a library. 
And Google did not copy the code to run it. They actually just, uh, what they're actually uh, using that uh, Oracle is something to copyright over is this string java.lang.math.max, comma, four, four, comma, six. And what's really interesting here is there's two separate questions he teed up. One is, can you copyright something like that? And if so, even if it is copyrightable, can other people use it as a fair, other people's use of it constitute fair use? And that is the thing laying at the bottom here, because when you hear declaring code versus implementing code, it can be quite um, abstract. I always find it very concrete to say, we're fighting over Java dot, the copyrightability and use of java.lang.math.maths4,x, 4, 4, 6. Anyway, just to make that a little bit clearer. All right. That, that was great, Christopher. And that's the example that is used by Justice uh, Breyer throughout the decision. It also raises merger issues that were not fully addressed, but uh, that's- so, I mean, and questions about functionality, all these other things that goes to basic copyrightability. But as you pointed out, the court did not address copyrightability. They assume it and simply dispose of the case on fair use. So in the, some of the most interesting questions you're talking about, we don't know. So uh, we have in the chat a question from Christian Stout. Uh, Christian, uh, because you're a friend of mine, or not all, would you like to ask your question out loud or do you want me to just read it? I, I could ask it out loud. Please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I, I found all of the presentations really fascinating. Um, so I could actually ask many questions, but one that stood out for me was uh, Gideon's proposal for uh, a, a second form of fair use. I didn't quite grasp the, um, the outline of how that would function as an alternative to traditional fair use. And I couldn't, from your presentation, I couldn't see how there would be upside to applying that in the Google case. Like, why would that apply there? What would be the gains from, from applying that there? Gideon, you are muted. There are many other applications and works that were based on Google's code, uh, okay, the code that incorporated Oracle's API. So now the problem is, okay, what Google did is fair use, but what about all the other user, users, uh, people who worked with that code and created additional works, if you want derivative works that are based on that code. Um, software that interacts with Google's version. Are they sheltered? Are they not sheltered? Can Java now go after them? Because they incorporated the same lines or use the same lines fully or to some degree in their works. That's the question. And there were many, many downstream users in this case. So, uh, that's a question to give you another example. Let, let's take the famous parody case, uh, Oh Pretty Woman, Two Live Food, okay? Uh, let's assume that we want to use to live whose version in our work, you and I. And we get permission from to live who to do that as many, many individuals and businesses got permission from Google. Is our version protected by fair use? The answer right now is it's unclear. We don't know. The ruling does not apply to us. Maybe, but we'll have to argue our case and get a ruling that is specific to the work that you and I produced. And it's the same problem that you have here, but I mean, to the power of, I don't know, um, very, I mean, it's much more pervasive in this case. That, that helps. I, yeah, I, what, where I, I guess I lost it was, no, I no, thought no, you no. Were, I'm sure that I didn't explain yeah. it well enough. No, so I, I, well, I, I thought that maybe you were proposing a different way of applying fair use in the first instance, but I see it's about downstream users exactly that you're worried right. about. Exactly okay. Right. Yes. And those are some of the most complex issues we're facing these days. Is we have a, a version of copyright that really was thinking about them almost as isolated works. We're now situating them in a much more complicated matrix. Um, I, uh, there's a question in the chat from James Bank Banco, and uh, I'm going to just read it. Uh, it's for Jennifer. In the Karen Hep case, other than an injunction, what other remedy is likely to inure to Hep's benefit if she wins? Money damages, and if so, disgorgement, loss of income, but if so, wouldn't that be too speculative? Are punitives permitted in this type of right of publicity action? 
Um, so it depends from uh, different states, whether they're, for example, statutory damages, um, but usually anything you can get in a, a tort case, you can get in a right of publicity claim. Um, here, she sought $10 million in damages. So the cases now will be on remand unless it gets reheard on bank or, or certs granted. So uh, they'll be litigating those damages. The damages will be potential lost endorsement deals. Um, you're right, there's some speculation. How much has her professional career and opportunities been negatively affected um, by the use of these images? Does that depress her salary? Has it depressed her ability to get different jobs? Um, and then there's also the reputational harm that she views as sort of selling her image in this way and her standing in the community. And that's going to be more similar to the type of damages you get in the context of defamation or a false light tort or other more traditional invasion of privacy torts. Um, there are some other instances in which we've seen damages that are in that order of magnitude. Michael Jordan got uh, about $9 million when his uh, identity was referenced in sort of a congratulatory promotional one page spread for a supermarket. Um, uh, the women tend not to do, which is uh, probably a whole other project, women tend not to recover as much in right of publicity lawsuits as men. Um, like orders of magnitude difference. Um, so I'm not sure exactly uh, why, why that is. Um, often the instances of litigation, there's another uh, case that was decided a couple years ago and that actually was decided on copyright grounds also involving, I think, a female newscaster whose image was taken in a wet t-shirt contest. So they often also have these, these sexualized uh, tone to them and, and she sued and she won, but she sued on a copyright ground uh, in that instance. So Herb, I have to ask you a question if I may, which is this scene, there are about 10 years ago, people used to say antitrust is sleepy. There's not much going on. And needless to say, that's just not true anymore. What do you think is drive? What has caused this change? And what do you think is going to, I mean, are we going to actually see a change in some of the statutes? I mean, this really seems to be a seminal moment in the world, in the history of antitrust. Um, I've been doing this a long time, and I can tell you, in my experience, antitrust is generally in a fairly even equilibrium, but then every so often some technological development uh, yields a big flurry of electricity. Uh, of activity. The first one was in the telephone industry back in the 80s and early 90s with the AT&T uh, breakup. And there were hundreds, literally, hundreds, as you know, hundreds of cases brought by small telecoms. And for a several year period, antitrust was all about telecoms. Then uh, in the activist era, about 15 or so years ago, it was all about pharmacy drugs, understanding the Hatch-Waxman Act, uh, a lot of the plaintiffs were generic drug producers or consumers. And then today we're, you know, we're in the middle of this platform era, which I presume uh, is going to wane eventually. Uh, I think there's some chance that there's going to be significant legislation, but as time goes on, I think there's less and less of that. And I think one of the worst problems is that the people pushing hardest for it are so disorganized. They have so many different ideas about what they want to do, uh, ranging from breaking them all up to rather modest injunctive relief. Uh, if they can't get on the same page, I think it's going to be much less likely we're going to have significant uh, litig uh, legislation. Well, thank you very much for all three of you. We are now at time. My last privilege is to announce the third word for the CLE. That word is case, uh, C-A-S-E, case. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you joining us. Thank you to Professors Havenkamp, Parchamovsky, and Rothman for providing us with such a scintillating and fascinating discussion. Uh, please uh, feel free to come to the CTI website and sign up to future events. And uh, on a monthly basis, keep your eye at, on the Penn website, and we will make sure that we will include give you further opportunities for discussions with our faculty and to keep abreast of all the latest developments.
Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I don't know. Are we still recording? I think we are. Yes. All right. So I shall see you tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Great job. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.